How's it going, folks? My name is Sean, and I wanted to introduce myself and give you a little tour of my studio here in Oklahoma City. But before I start taking you through all the stuff, let me give you a little background story of myself, where I came from, and how all of this really started. So I'm primarily a guitar player, and I started playing music around 13. Grew up in South Dallas, and music kind of helped me stay out of trouble. My aunt actually let me borrow my first real guitar, which was a Mitchell Acoustic, and I actually still have it. That guitar was the first one that I actually really cared about changing the strings on a more frequent basis. After learning how to play Metallica as best as I could on acoustic, my dad took pity on me and made me a deal. Read The Lord of the Rings, and I'll buy you an electric guitar setup. So that's exactly what I did. I read the whole book. And yes, it really is one giant book. And about a week later, we went to Mars Music. Y'all remember Mars Music? He bought me an ESP LTD M155 and a Fender Frontman amp, and I never looked back. Over the next 25 years or so, guitars, bands, and song ideas have come and gone. There were times where music was less often a focus for me, and my career in IT and my family took precedent. Designing data centers and solutions for businesses exposed me to wonderful opportunities to get extremely technical and fan the spark for outside-the-box thinking. But I always loved the process of actually making music and the true democracy of working together with musicians to create the best possible product. Over the years, in a few different bands, I've been lucky enough to actually be able to go into a studio and record some songs that I was really proud of at the time. As musicians, we're always getting better and more refined, whether that's in technique or style, or even just exposed to better gear. My first song actually was recorded with an ESP 7-string and a Digitech GNX 3000 pedal, all the mids scooped and everything. But I was always keen on the process of actually making music, asking questions of folks who knew more than me, and really paying attention to the art of making music itself. Fast forward to 2019, and the band that I've been with for the last 12 years or so started writing music again. Now, I had already started dabbling at making music at the house with the secondhand Mac Pro. It was a Mac Pro 5,1 cheese grater that I upgraded as best as I could with a copy of GarageBand and a handful of amps. Then I ran out of space in my office. 2020, I moved all my stuff into the garage and posed the question to the guys, why don't we just make the album ourselves? I had enough space in the garage for my drummers, stuff, seating, all the amps we would need. Why not? It would save us money overall, at least I thought it would at the time, and we wouldn't be pressed for time or on the clock at someone else's studio for tracking drums faster, setting up drums faster, playing drums faster. So the winter of 2020, I ordered up all the gear needed, thank you Sweetwater, and I got to putting together the garage studio. 16 channels of Focusrite goodness and a bunch of homemade acoustic panels and bass traps. But if you give a musician space, he will fill it up with stuff. And that's exactly what I did. Pretty soon the garage was full, but my wife was still letting me run with the idea of a studio. So we posed the question, do we build up, do we build out, or do we move? All at the height of COVID. A couple of contractors did come out and give us crazy bids to build up and out, but I really just think they, they didn't want to work. And housing prices were, were, were really starting to climb, and we couldn't find a house in the area that checked all the boxes without making the kids move schools, which is something we weren't willing to do. So I opted to build a building in the backyard, took a sledgehammer to the old storm shelter, and committed myself to the project. By February of 21, I had found a contractor that had never built a studio before, but was crazy enough to work with me on the design. And by summer of 2021, I had replaced the storm shelter and Big Nerd Studios was built. It's about 350 square foot of space, plus some space for storage of boxes, shells, cases, etc., with dedicated power, air conditioning, and internet, a place dedicated to making music. So here we are at the beginning of 2024. I'm really proud of the space. It's comfortable to work in day in and day out, and it's comfortable to create music in. I actually work out of this space every day for my job, and I can easily swivel to record an idea or just take a break and play guitar instead of playing on my phone. So let me take you through the space and show you around. All right, folks, this is the view of my studio as people walk in as i said before it's about 350 square feet more or less but that's before taking in account 10 inch walls um, for the studio nerds 
I used half inch plywood, six inches of insulation, an inch and a half air gap. Then on each of the two by sixes, there are RSC clips that hold the fur channel metal strips that the sheetrock is adhered to. And each of those RSC clips have these metal grommets on them that help absorb vibrations from the sheetrock. The sheetrock is the Soundbreak XP 5 8 uh, thick sheetrock. And then as you can see, I have lots and lots of homemade sound panels and bass traps. And I have a couple of clouds. These are four by four by six inch clouds that I made with Pokemon sheets. Probably need to change those. So let's uh let's start over here in the drum area so as you can see my uh, drum space is based around a pdp x7 kit with a few extra pieces um all of the microphones stay mic'd up cabled up ready to go 100 percent of the time and i adopted the slate digital virtual mic system um, all of the mics I have on there are their pencil mics, except for the snare mic, which I think everybody can agree that an SM57 on the snare is the best choice for that. I do have a SM57 on the outside of the kit just for experimentation. The kit has, I think, 11 or 12 microphones on it at all times. Plus I have two TRS connections for doing triggers on the snare and the kick. And then I have a room mic that I use for capturing the room in the center. And that's the microphone over on the other side. We'll get to that in a minute. Over here we have um, my Herman Miller chair. I have two of these and I pull that out whenever I have um, clients or folks I'm working with at the studio desk. This is my kind of catch-all slash guitar repair setup workstation for changing strings, cleaning, etc. I also got some tools. Uh, the third shelf handles all my camera stuff. Some gimbals, which is what I'm using right now. Some MagSafe stands for my iPhone. And then some power cables in the bottom. Currently, I'm working on restringing my Made in Japan 1987 Stratocaster. A um, couple of the mods that I've done is I installed this Vera trim that my wife got me for Christmas. I really wasn't a fan of the six-point trim that came on it. So this gives me more versatility and smoothness in the tremolo system. I also replaced the pickups with uh, the DG20 David Gilmore EMG set. Um, this thing We'll do Pink Floyd stuff all day long now, twice on Sunday. Over here, I have my ML, I want to say it's an ML1 traditional or an ML3 traditional, I can't remember. But I bought this from Anderton's in Guilford. And as you can see, Captain Lee himself signed back for back of it, so I appreciate that. It's a wonderful representation of a Stratocaster. In the middle... I have my Alex Lifeson Epiphone Signature Axis model. Um, it's an amazing Les Paul. And I'm not a big fan of Les Pauls because they're a little too heavy most of the time. But since the Axis are chambered, this one's much more comfortable to play. And it's got the uh, Graph Tech Floyd system and the Paizo pickup with the stereo output jacks. I did a cover of Limelight with that on the YouTube channel, and I'll link that in the description so you can hear how it sounds. As we go around, here is my seating area for anybody that's here. Um, just a couple of amazingly comfortable chairs I got off of Amazon, and they're really positioned nicely for the listening um, with my speakers. In the center, I usually keep a guitar for just kind of futzing around, and this is my breed love ac25 acoustic it's an electric acoustic and um it's a wonderful wonderful playing guitar over here we'll go to the third guitar on the wall this is um this is a knockoff prs 
before I was able to afford a PRS. Um, I built this from a from a just a kit body. Um, I put new, new tuners, um, the Seymour Duncan P rail system in it with the matching pickup rings with the selectors, so I can get single coil um, P90 in phase, out of phase, humbucker, whatever I need. But this guitar was actually um, built in remembrance of my great grandmother, Bernice, as you can see right there. She passed away in 2016 and she left us a little bit of money. So, you know, I put that together in remembrance of her. This is my room mic and my primary vocal mic. It's the Slate Digital Large Diaphragm microphone. And this, this microphone and the pencil mics on the drum kit get me to you know, 90% of what I need without getting into analysis, analysis paralysis of what mic is best for overheads versus toms versus vocals for clean versus vocals for, uh, you know, growling and screaming. As somebody who's just learning, I didn't want to, I didn't want to focus on that and focus more on making music. So I went with that system and I couldn't be happier with it. Um, here's my cable wall. Um, I use Diodario NYXLs almost exclusively. And I've got pretty much every size of string you could want for standard tuning, drop tunings, um, alternate tunings. Um, I also have lots of HOSA cables um, and monster cables for, you know, however many instruments we need to mic up, XLRs. I can run microphones pretty much anywhere in this room. The, uh, these guitars are ones that I don't play as often, but are still amazing. This first one is a 2005 ESP LTD EC1000 with a JB59 setup. Um, another representation of a really good Les Paul that's not as heavy. Next is my Fender Jazzmaster. My wife got me this for my 30th birthday. It's got P90s in it. And I had it uh, recently set up and had the frets redone and cleaned, so it played really nice. This was a show guitar I put together a few years ago. It's a EC-256 from ESP, but I took a blowtorch to it to give me uh, you know, better aesthetics on stage. And it has uh, the Seymour the Duncan Distortion matching set. Next is my PRS SE Silver Sky. The only reason why it's over here is because I've been playing the Japanese Strat, but this is a wonderful Strat. I, I think John Mayer is one of the best blues guitar players out there right now, and uh, PRS outdid themselves with this Strat. And then the last one is you can't be a Rush fan without having a headless bass. So I have a headless bass, and it does what headless bass do. All right. Next, this is my work from home station for my normal day job that pays for all of this. Um, I design data centers. So I get to work out of here every day and Rush helped me. Gandalf helps me. And Ron Swanson helps me. I think uh, between those five, I've got all the encouragement and wisdom that I need. Now there's my dedicated AC heater. Some headphones, lots of Baron Dynamics. Um, I use a lot of my panels for holding boxes and decorations and extra pedals and things like that. Over here, we've got my Mesa 4x12 oversized cab. This is a Jet City 2x12 open back and it has a Alnico Blue and a Weber. And then this is a mid-84-85 mid uh, JC60. It was a combo. But I had a very talented woodworker buddy of mine turn it into a head, and it just kind of works. This guitar is a 1980 Takamini acoustic that I bought literally three days after Rhett did his video about the hidden gems that the lawsuit Takaminis were. I went up to Seattle to see a buddy of mine, and we always go guitar hunting at several stores that that are in the area and i found this one on the north side and it was just literally hanging on the wall for like 400 bucks and he was absolutely right these uh old lawsuit takaminis play as just as good as any of the martins of the day next is my prized possession it's a 2019 p 
PRS Custom 24 with a Paizo. It's the Faded Well Blue and a 10 top. And this is my favorite guitar. And it stays at my right hand side all the time. It's in standard right now with 10 to 52s. Next, we'll go through this rack. Right here, I have a Jericho from a manufacturer in Dallas. Um, it's in drop C and it has the bare knuckle aftermath set. This is my PRS Custom 24S2 and it's in drop C and it has the EMG 5766 set in it. That's how it came. I bought it secondhand and uh, it, it's an amazing guitar. This was my first PRS brand new that I bought. 2018, 2019 uh, CE24 in the whale blue and it's, it's all stock and it's one of my favorites and it's in drop C. Next is my custom Kiesel CT6. You've seen this on the channel before when I did the Yellow Rose amp demo. It has the beryllium in the neck and I can't remember the, the single coil, and it has a lithium in the bridge. And I can coil tap both, and so it gives me, you know, what, 13, 9 different settings, something like that. Next is my most recent acquisition. It's a Jackson Soloist 7-string with the 7-string versions of the Duncan Distortion. Super flat neck, super fast, plays, sounds great. And then last is my Mark Holcomb PRS SE signature. It's the first gen with the Alpha Omega pickups. And this one is tuned, I think, to B standard, maybe drop A, somewhere around there. All right. Next is my Tower of Gain. This is, you know, the seven most amp, seven, the seven amps that I use the most. I have a couple of amps up on the loft for storage, but um, these pretty much cover everything that I need. So we'll start at the top and work my way down. So the first one is a um, Bugera Triple Rectifier. Um, I'm probably going to replace this hopefully soon with the, the new PRS MT100. It's a great budget triple rec, but you know it, it just doesn't... It doesn't sound sonically equal to the rest of them. The next is the uh, first gen Laney Ironheart 120H, and I have it in the EL84 configuration right now. And this has been one of my favorite amps for better part of 12 years now since I got it. Next is my mid 2013 2014 Spawn Quick Rod. Um, an amazing representation and interpretation of some of the hot rodded marshals that, you know, Jose in the late 80s uh, LA scene did. Um, this particular head is really dark. So I have a, uh, an EQ pedal that I bought specifically for this head to kind of brighten it up a little bit. Next is uh, just a tried and true uh, Bass Breaker 15. Um, good all around workhorse of an amp. Next is my PV Invective Mini Head. This thing is the loudest 25 watts I've ever heard. Next is my Hughes and Kettner Statesman Dual EL34. Wonderful, clean, chimey, um, lots of headroom on the clean channel, and amazing um, British martially overdriven sound. And then last is my um, handcrafted Seriotone Joy. Joyful Music 50. It's a clone of John Mayer's Two Rock, which is a clone of his Dumble. Single channel headroom for days. All of these heads are routed through my Delisle amp switcher, which handles amps, effects loop, and attenuator. So I can just say, you know, I want amp four on speaker three, which is my uh, two notes to uh, captor X that sits on the desk. 
but I can just pick an amp, pick a speaker configuration and go without having to worry about changing, you know, changing cables around. My main um, attenuator is a two notes torpedo reload and it just handles, you know, the, the master volume so that way I can save my hearing. My pedal board is uh, the setup is divided into before before amp and in the effects loop. So we'll start with the uh, the, the before amp. I have a tried and true Ernie Ball volume, uh, Dunlop Wah, TC Polytune Two, SP compressor from uh, Exotic. Picked that up in a music store in New York City. And then it hits my drive section, which is going to go first with my TC Spark, which I primar primarily keep in a clean boost configuration. And then it hits my horse meat, which absolutely love. And I use those two almost exclusively together for low, medium gain settings. Then my precision, my precision drive from Horizon Devices. Um, that's my primary drive for heavy stuff. And then I have my DNM drive for um, just any other coloration or saturation I may want. Um, a, because I love that pedal show, and B, because Keeley is from Oklahoma City. He's here, and so i got to represent. Then everything hits the front of the Delisle, goes through the amps, back through the Delisle, and hits the effects loops. And the first thing in the chain is my uh, Flashback X4 from TC Electronic. And then it hits the Keeley Halo, and that has the M Audio MIDI controller right here to control. Um, I want to say it controls mix right now on any of the patches. Then uh, after the Halo, it hits the Hall of Fame reverb. Then it hits the Corona. I'm probably going to replace the Hall of Fame reverb with the Poly verb when it comes out. Um, I'm on the pre-order wait list for that. And then I'm probably going to replace the Corona with the the TC. 1210 pedal version so I can get those 80s clean um, reverb or the clean chorus from like the, the good 80s late rush stuff. So I want to replace that. And then I hit the decimator and then I have pedals after the decimator so that way um, it's those those tones are unaffected and that's going to be my quintessence harmony pedal, my looper, and my boss EQ200 which I have with a it's got a treble boost and a bass cut right now, and that's primarily for the Splawn. So we'll go back to the desk. And this is my primary mix position. So Big Nerd Studios right now runs on a MacBook Pro M2 Max with 64 gigs of RAM. The, I can run, I think, 175 channels with you know six, eight plugins each. So more than enough capacity to run any sort of any sort of workload or project needed. My primary monitors are these two Focal Twin Evos. Um, I, I absolutely love these. Wide sound stage, great coverage of lows, so much so that I don't actually have to have a subwoofer, but I do. Um, it's a That one's a JBL 310S. Sits right in the middle underneath the desk. My second set of speakers are my um, Adam Audio T7Vs, and these were really my first real set of speakers. And I love these because they're a stark contrast to the Focals. Um, if you remember on my work desk, I have the Cali Audio LP6V2s, but these sound very similar and characteristic to the Focals, and I wanted something that was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit different. So I keep the Calis over here. Then I have for programming, you know, beats and rhythms and drums, the uh, Native Instruments Machine Micro Mark III. There's the Captor X that I mentioned earlier. Primary con uh, surface controller is an X Touch from Behringer, but I have the SSL, the UF8, UF1, and the, the SSL controller in my sites. So I'd like to I'd like to fill in this gap and hide all the cables and stuff and just have you know clean SSL controllers for that. Primary uh, MIDI controller is the 
Arturia Key Lab 88 Mark 1. It's been a wonderful, wonderful controller, but I'm hoping, hoping this year at NAM, which um, I will be at, they're going to hopefully launch a, a Mark 3. So I would love to love to upgrade this and get some polyphonic aftertouch like the new um, Native Instruments S88 has. And then here's my primary rack for recording. So I have a central station from Personas for my speaker controller. I settled on this. Um, I really wanted something from Dangerous Music, but I just couldn't justify the cost right now. I think I picked this one up for like 200 bucks, and it, and, and you know, it, it does what it's supposed to do. It gives me the knob. Um, so it's pretty transparent, but you know, at some point that'll be the next thing I replace. Then the primary interface is the new Audio Fuse 16 from Arturia, and I'm going to do a whole video dedicated on why I got this, but this gives me all the ins and outs I need with um, ADAC connections to this um, 18i20 and this Octopre. Um, I don't have to mess with the aggregate devices anymore. It's all one big interface, all the ins and outs I could ever want without, I don't have to mess with drums, hooking up, on disconnecting if I want to record guitar. Everything stays hooked up all the time. I have a art patch bay. Underneath the underneath the main rack in the rack of the legs, I have a two-channel art digital preamp for the top and bottom mics for the snares. They're tube driven, and that goes into the audio fuse directly. I bought that because when I was just running the 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 18i20, I wanted to have those two extra channels that was on the the digital SPDIF, but the only preamp that would work was the ART2 digital because it, it has really good quick um, DAC converters to go from the analog XLRs and then it'll give me the two channels out via the, the digital RCA SPDIF. Behind my Mesa cab, I've got a couple of extra keyboards. Um, the primary one is a Korg X50. I'll probably do a review on how I have that set up because it's an old keyboard and the editor only works on Windows because it's a 32-bit, so I have to do a weird, you know, remote desktop connection. So I'll do a quick video on that at some point to show how I do that. Um, so yeah, um, I've got a camera in here that records pretty much all the time. So anytime we're doing sessions, if we want a bird's eye view of anything, or if we're writing something and you know we need to capture it, you know, I can go pull footage from that. So yeah. This is my humble humble studio. I'll give you a quick tour of the the loft mess. So I've got you know 16 feet by six feet of capacity. So you know 82, 80, 72 square feet up there. So it holds cases, boxes, extra panels, keyboard um, keyboard stands. I've got a couple of combo amps. The the white one is a 60 watt. Fender Supersonic with a cream back. And the black one is a Marshall DSL 40 with a um, VET 30 from Warehouse Speakers. The Behind the curtains, I have a couple of windows that are double pane, um, and I'm going to fill them in with some boxes that'll have um, sheetrock in them to you know, deaden the sound because th those are my weak points. And then my door is a solid core metal door. Um, I've got room to put a second, but I haven't really needed it right now. And this is my my reminder to make sure I turn my amps off. Because sometimes I'll leave them on standby for if I leave the house or leave the studio for a minute. So always, always make sure you turn your amps off. So yeah, this is my, this is my studio. So I want to thank you today for coming on this journey and touring my studio. I know it's been about 30 minutes, so I really appreciate it. If you like what you saw, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and hit that bell for notifications. I plan on doing a lot more content, um, especially after NAM. Hopefully some, hopefully some really good things will come out of the NAM show. Um, every week I also do live streams. Sometimes it's orchestral composition stuff with plugins and software instruments. Other times it's going to be you know, traditional heavy metal rock stuff with guitars, programming drums, etc. I don't sing, so I won't, you know, I won't make y'all listen to that. But 
the music is what I'm here for. So live streams every week, hopefully regular content coming out soon. Hit those buttons, and I appreciate y'all tuning in today. Y'all have a good day.